Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you. Thanks for joining us for another webinar. My name's Andy Cooper. I'm coming to you from Yamaha Research and Development Center in Milton Keynes, United Kingdom. It's about 100 kilometers north of London. I hope you're all keeping well. I hope you're all surviving uh, the situation around the world. Now, I am not alone today, thankfully. I am joined in the room by my technical crew. We've got Tim and Mark and Ascot uh, assisting with this production. But in the USA, we have a, a wonderful friend for, uh, and colleague for many years, Ashley Shepard is uh, joining us from his studio in Cincinnati. Hi, Ashley. Hello. How is everybody? Yeah, thank, you for, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Wonderful to, to hear you there. Um, I am right, isn't, aren't I? Cincinnati is in Ohio? It's in Ohio, yes. It, the way I always like to describe it is if, if you have Chicago up here and you have Nashville down here, I'm basically like right in the middle there. And technically, I'm in Kentucky. So oh. this is where we make bourbon and race horses and do all that sort of stuff. I'm right across the river from Cincinnati, but you know, I could walk to Cincinnati from here. So. Sounds wonderful. So yeah, mm -hmm. the, the city is on the border, isn't it? Of, the, of those right. two states then, yeah. The Ohio River is our border. So I'm, yeah. I'm in the Newport, Kentucky, which is uh, just across, this, across the street, across the river. Cool. <laughs> Have you got good weather there today? Uh, a little sticky, a little hot. Yeah. Um, yeah okay. we get it all here if, if you don't like it we just wait 15 minutes it's gonna change <laughs> that's a that's a bit like our situation here i mean no, there's no there's no hot and sticky here but mm. it's it's a uh, varying level varying degrees of rain or or um or humid or humidity precipitation yeah dodging right. the the rain clouds <laughs> but uh apparently there's there's some sunny weather coming up for us uh here oh so. good that's good but hey we've got we've got viewers and guests from around the world i know we have a whole range of people watching from india and indonesia yeah. in particular indonesia. and yeah yeah Jakarta, even though it's the middle perhaps? of the night there even though it's the middle of the night we know we have uh, we have viewers there because we're, we're broadcasting on facebook in uh, okay. india and indonesia mm -hmm. and i know we, we've had a lot of people registered from mexico as well and uh, as well as yeah europe including uh particularly in germany too so thank you everybody for joining us it's it's wonderful to to have you here so we are talking about live streaming and we are exactly live right now aren't we um we are in fact just... doing what we're talking about aren't we <laughs> indeed yeah and we got some multi-track uh music material that we're gonna sort of use in our uh as part part of our discussion um today but um yeah let's begin by just mentioning what equipment we are using for this so uh clearly i've got a yamaha tf1 mixer here which i am um using with multi track recording and so on and i'm actually using a dante connection from this mixer to our live streaming equipment i believe you're also using dante uh, ashley but uh, with a yes. different beast a different beast indeed yes uh my, my studio has been hooked up via dante for quite some years now which i find very very convenient because i have several computers and I can use the Dante virtual sound card to interconnect between them. And, uh, but primarily I use Nuendo as my workstation and this is a Nuage uh, control surface that, that runs that. Um, and I, I also have in the same computer, I have a Dante virtual sound card that's running and it, it's sort of running interconnected. And so that's how I'm, you know, uh, over zoom transmitting my live stream, if you will. So. Yeah. Fantastic. And it looks, looks, Wonderful. <laughs> Looks like a, a great environment to work in. Um, and talking of which, you know, for for live streaming, one of the key points for success is to have a good place to mix from, isn't it? So, um, um, oh, I just yeah. skipped a PowerPoint. I'm dancing with my feet here <laughs> below the table to <laughs> to control the PowerPoint. But yeah, the, the environment you mix in is is really important, Ashley, isn't it? Could you, could you describe how how you would advise people who are seeking to do a live stream mix for the first time 
Well, you know, uh, oftentimes live streams are live events where you might have an audience or a PA system in the room with performers. It could be any number of different things. And to really get a good mix, you need to be outside of that room in the best case scenario. You need to be isolated like a recording studio. You, you need to be in another space, uh, whether that's uh, something like what you have on the screen there, uh, you know, a small studio room, a dressing room in the backstage of the venue. In my case, um, my studio is built in a church and we, you know, on purpose, we, we have a live space upstairs that we can record in, but we can also have performances in. Yeah, there's a picture right there. Yeah. Um, uh, right now we just did a, we've been doing a blues record all week upstairs in the live room, but we could also have a performance up there, but the control rooms, I have two control rooms and they're both downstairs in the basement. So we're very, very well isolated from the upstairs space. We can hear actually what we're mixing. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's an important thing. Um, and you know, worst case scenario, you can use uh, headphones or some sort of closed back headphone system. If you have to be in the same room with yeah. the participants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so particularly if it's if it's a so-called hybrid event where you have some live audience, so you need a PA system, but you're also live streaming the same event. And maybe if you have limited resources, then perhaps you have to have one one mixing console to to uh, perform two to two the the two jobs, the mixing desk. Uh, half the mixing desk needs to work the PA system and the other half needs to work the live stream, for example. So Yes. Um, actually, a little bit later in this webinar, we'll talk a bit more about a solution where you can use an iPad or a computer to remote control the mixer from a distance, uh, which, yeah, it would be highly recommended to find an isolated place to mix. So I have done some live stream mixing, you know, just with, uh, with these earbuds in, which give you about 20 to 25 dB of, of uh, isolation, but typically that's not enough, is it? Because well, maybe a live, let's say a live event is going up to 90 D around 90 dB. Um, yeah. But in your, the ambient sound of uh, people's living rooms where they're going to be watching the stream is around 40 to 50 dB. So you have a 40 dB difference um, in, in level um, between what the audience at home are experiencing and what you are mixing in so you've got to find at least 40 db of gain reduction or isolation to do uh, a decent mix that's reasonable plus also when you're in the room with music if there's any sort of drum set or any sort of big big musical items even orchestral stuff you perceive um sound with more than just your ears your body mm. you feel it and if you're feeling it that's not going to be transmitted on the live stream. You're, you're, you're kidding yourself. You know, it's all about hearing a true picture of what's actually going out to other people. So there's that as well. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, Ashley. And, and I have experienced um, other people who've done a, a live stream when I've been in the band um, mm. that the loudest in acoustic instruments always end up being the quietest on, on the live stream. Yep. Because the, the person is mixing in the room with the band, they are feeling the the kick drum and the and the and the the bass guitar. So they're not putting it into the mix that much because they yes. think they're hearing it in their in their earphones, but actually the sound is bypassing their earphones and getting to their inner ear kind of through through their body. So mm -hmm. um absolutely. So you always have to bear that in mind, don't you? And uh, mm -hmm. Um, I'll either the, the learn how to compensate for it or find a quiet place to, to find a in. quiet place. That's one of those things with Dante that's great because you can just take a cable and, you know, go 100 feet that way. Just get out or, you know, even, you know, take it outside to a van or something. Any way you can get out outside of the space that you're mixing, that you're yeah. recording. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Let's uh, talk about levels next. Mm. So, um, you know, le level meters are highly visual ways of of um, of describing the sound you're you're trying to mix, but um, our ears should be our primary tool for mixing, shouldn't they? But uh, level meters are always a good guide for us. Well, yes. you know, we have to we have to consider uh, how people are watching live streams. Mm. Uh, most of the listening is going to occur on a laptop, maybe on like a, a Fire Stick or Apple TV on their television or on a phone. 
iPad, yeah. Yeah. anything of those natures. And, and uh, they tend to be small output devices. It's not a three-way, you know, giant monitoring system uh, yeah. where it's going to be all cranked up. So we are mixing for a typically a smaller playback system or in-ear, you're like earbuds and that sort of thing. Yeah. So my point is uh, level can be very important in those situations. Uh, if you're not loud enough, um, that can be really detrimental to the experience of the viewers. Indeed. Yeah, there, there are various ways you can get level meters wrong. <laughs> on, on As there. we found out in our own experience setting this in, webinar indeed. up. I mean, yeah. It's a decent yeah. point. We, we can talk about that. Yeah. Sure. But yeah, if if you if you transmit your your broadcast too quietly, then it gets noisy or, or it's difficult to get loud enough for the people listening on, on small devices at home. If you broadcast your stream too loudly it's going to get heavily compressed it could get distorted and it won't be so enjoyable for the listener yes. or you could have too much variation couldn't you between different uh, pro types of program material so um I i've been involved with a lot of house of worship live streams obviously you have you have quiet times uh, of prayer or or of uh, of preaching well preaching sometimes can be loud but then you have times of band band as well so you've got quite a wide dynamic range which uh in a pa system you would utilize live to to build some excitement with the music and, and some quiet reflection with the prayers but you you can't have people at home reaching for the volume knob every five minutes to turn down for the music turn up for the for the speech and so on you you need to manually make the levels a lot smoother don't don't you when when you're broadcasting well we certainly need to build a situation where uh, the, the best way i can describe it it's not it's not realistic it's mm. an illusion of realism anybody who thinks <laughs> that we're going to transmit a realistic picture of what's going on if you are in the room that's not going to work you have to think of in illusory terms so yeah. even though the quiet section where you know the preacher is maybe giving a sermon or something like that is quiet it really needs to be up in volume for a number of reasons for intelligibility uh primarily and then uh, uh just to to draw people in sometimes you turn up the volume of somebody speaking when they're speaking quietly and it draws you in more so there's this, there is some psychology to it it is illusory and manipulative. <laughs> I know that sounds horrible, but that's what we got to do. That's our job yeah. is to make the experience engrossing and 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 interesting. Yeah. For the yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. At this point, I'm just going to remind our viewers that we have a Q and A facility in Zoom. You should be able to find a Q and A icon um, in your Zoom app, which you can use. Uh, tap on there and type a question, and we'll uh, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can a little bit later in uh, mm -hmm. in this broadcast, which we expect to to limit within one hour. But uh, oh, I've just seen one pop up as yes. I'm speaking. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Have the questions it's... coming in. We'll we'll deal with them in, in in a little bit of time as as best we can. But um, we're talking about level meters for live streaming and and. How, how can we use level meters to sort of make sure our program material is at a fairly consistent level for, for the listener? Well, th there's, there's one concept that everybody really needs to understand. And this will help with the two questions that have already been, or the questions that I see that have already been posed. Dynamic range. Mm. And the discussion of dynamic range is, this is what we're here to, to talk about, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there are two things to consider with dynamic. Well, dynamic range is a whole concept. There's other things to consider. But the two most important things that we're focused on are the peak, the instantaneous peak level at any given point in time, and the average level. You might have heard this called RMS, root mean square level. Uh, you might hear like LUFS terms, which is more of an averaging level. It basically means the average level of the sound over time. Whereas yeah. the peak level is the instantaneous voltage level or digital level of the sound at any given moment. And the ratio of those two, how close is the average sound to the peak sound? That's mm. what we're talking about. Okay. The, the average sound is is your is more how you're going to perceive the loudness of whatever we're listening to, and the peak sound. 
it has to do with the punch and some of the dynamics and excitement, but it also has much more to do with the electronics and how we control our level and stuff like that. We need to get the average level to a point that is reasonable for these types of situations while controlling the peak level so that we don't overload equipment. Yeah. In a nutshell. Yeah, great. So um, if we look at um, a slide I've got here, which just shows the level meters of a the TF console I have beside me and level meters that you find on a Yamaha analog mixer, an M MG series, um, they're both on a different scale there, but they both change from green to orange. And, um, and at that point, that's what you call the nominal level of a mixer. And that's the level that you can use to help set uh, the gain structure in your system, isn't it? So uh, that's, um, that's something we carefully did while we were setting up for this webinar, but came, <laughs> came up with a few hurdles. Um, but uh, what, what I typically tell to people who are live streaming, well, with, with, with a popular live streaming device like the ATEM Mini that I think you have, Ash, uh, maybe today, ATEM, ATEM, yeah, that, that one, the ATEM Mini Pro, that has level meters that you can see on screen um, in, in the multi-view window. And yes. it conveniently changes from green to yellow within the minus 20 to minus 10 dB range, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, uh, I often tell people who are not experienced with live streaming to, to keep the levels bouncing around within that orange range, you know, whether it's music or speech for a typical um, house of worship service, um, keep the levels bouncing around there and you're going to be roughly in the right sort of range. But that's, that's um, teaching non-audio people about levels. We can go a little bit deeper uh, right now, can't we? So how, how do you set up the levels for a live stream system? Well, we have, we have two things that, that we have to be aware of. One was what I was just talking about, this average level versus the peak level, simply yeah. called peak to average ratio or uh -huh. crest factor. There's a number of yeah. terms that people use for this, but it's how much difference is there between the maximum instantaneous peak and then sort of the average of the program material. Very mm -hmm. important. Uh, the next thing is, our meters all have to be telling us the same thing across the board. Just because the meter on your TF console says our level is here, does that mean it's the same in the streaming software? Mm. Who knows? You, you have to measure it. And we use yeah. tones and we calibrate that. We, make, we align the two together. So that when we're looking at that TF mixer or the, the, the level meter here in the window, which is a fantastic meter, yeah. um, we know that we're seeing truth, uh, that it's accurate downstream. And that requires calibration. And then we can talk about um, what an optimal peak to average ratio is. This is where we're setting our levels. But, but we need to calibrate the system so we, we know the level we set is the level that's actually going out to the live stream. So yeah, indeed. those are the two things. Yeah. So it, if you have a digital mixer like like um the tf here or if you have um something like nuage with with nuendo or cubase software you'll have an oscillator built in and you can set that to the sort of maximum output level you want let's say we shouldn't really go above minus 3 db fs to allow just a little headroom so if if you transmit um minus 3 db fs of uh, oscillator I'm not going to do that now because our listeners won't really like laugh. it. <laughs> then, yeah, you, then you can make sure that's not going to overload any point in your signal chain, um, perhaps through your vision mixer, through your software. Because um, so level meters like like come with Zoom, which we're using now. If we just quickly see this PowerPoint slide um, uh, in the the broadcast, um, there's no level indication. It's it's just a just a bar of colors that you see in zoom so you can't be exactly sure what you're seeing on these kind of level meters you get in uh, streaming software you have to use your ears as well so so do a trial broadcast and listen 
listen to the result of that trial broadcast and and uh, try and make sure you're not uh, not uh, overloading or causing distortion there indeed so um ashley you mentioned lufs or 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 luffs which is something that's been talked about a lot in in europe and uh, particularly in the broadcast community uh they talk about lufs and um yeah that is a relationship between uh, momentary peaks and and program averages and uh it, no, it is broadcast, it's, yeah, a, it, it's a definition of peak to average ratio i mean that's yeah. that's what all these metering standards are are what's the level over time versus the instantaneous level this is this is the core concept yeah yeah so obviously in, in a lot of typical tv broadcast it, it, it it's drama it's comedy it's a lot of speech there's sound effects and uh, they they want to sort of surprise you from time to time with, with huge dynamic range you know you, you you want to be you want to jump out of your seat when you hear an explosion or, or you want to be scared when you when you hear um a, a a roaring dinosaur or something but then you, you want the intimacy of a whisper and, and bird song as well so they tend to use a much um lower level of lufs or a much wider dynamic range than you would want with pop music for example um so youtube tend to go for a, a higher level also because they are often listened to in, in a noisier ambient environment um as well which is an, another consideration but i know actually you you prefer to mix with something called the k system when you're mixing music for live streaming is that right yeah it's something that comes i believe it comes with the cubase pro but it's definitely in the window uh bob katz yeah. who's a well-known mastering engineer came up with yeah. the system bob and katz, hence the k hence the k yeah and uh the whole idea was to move the zero point away from zero db full scale which is sort of a it's a weird misleading number because everybody's like oh i want to get to zero i want to get to zero yeah but that's zero db full scale is maximum you, that's mm. the end mm. of the road mm. so the k system says let's pick a another zero point on the digital scale that's appropriate for the type of material we're working with for example, K20, theatrical use, classical music, film mixing. It's been the minus. Mm. What, basically, what it is is the zero point on a K20 meter is 20 dB down from zero dB full scale. That's all yeah. it is. So K14, the zero point is at minus 14. K12, zero point is at minus 12 dB full scale. So we know in digital, because all, most of the stuff is it was based on the digital scale. That yeah. zero dB full scale is max. You can't go any louder. There are no more numbers available to mm -hmm. calculate that level. So that's always the, the peak. So all yeah. we're working with is where the average is. Is the average at minus 12, minus 14, minus 20? Or in the case of the LUFS meter, it's the same idea. Minus 23 LUFS. It there and notice they're similar numbers. I mean, a K uh, LUFS thirteen for YouTube is very similar to K fourteen, yeah. essentially yeah. the same idea. Um, also on a K meter, and this is very important. <clears throat> you'll see two different indicators. You'll see a peak indicator, which tells you what the instantaneous peak is, and then you'll have this lower colorized meter that shows you where the average level is. And that's yeah, that's what yeah. you need to know. You need to see the peak. You need to see the average. And the the LUFS has a similar thing, although it's a slower reacting system. So that's those are the tools you need to to get control of your peak to average ratio. Great, great. Boom. So when when you're mixing and watching a um, a, a K. 12 meter for your music would you be trying to keep it within keep it within the orange zone um kind of the, the peaks in the orange or would you allow some peaks in in that red zone peaks can go all the way up to zero in the in okay the, in, certainly for mastering on a cd and whatnot you know your your idea of keeping it minus three just some amount of db below the maximum is is mm. sort of safety cautious mm. conservative and that's fine um uh, but the peak can go all the way to zero. There's nothing right. wrong with that, but you better have control. Because <laughs> yeah. if it goes over, yeah, it, it's going to be clipped. 
Um, yeah. So there's your peak. And then, you know, these meters, the average sound of your song, let's say, hovers around that reference point. If it's a K14 meter, it's 14 dB down from zero, and, and you'll see the zero point on that meter. And, you know, your mix is hovering there. Maybe the last chorus is super loud and it goes a few dB above that, fine. Mm. Or there's a breakdown verse and it comes beneath that. That's okay. It's just sort of the average. It's a guidepost. Yeah. Great. And that, this, this is really interesting now, isn't it? Because cause we can now use the same model of, of metering or level management for live streaming as we can for preparing a song for Spotify or, or YouTube or Apple Music or whatever, because they all yep. use a, a, a similar system now, don't they? Yes, yes. And and the, the common parlance today is this K14, the minus 14 level for these streaming services when we're talking about music, uh, uh, generally speaking, that is the point we're looking at. That's a good rule of thumb for you to utilize today for YouTube, Facebook, Zoom, sending stuff to Spotify, you, uh, iTunes, those are that's a reasonable level. It's on the louder side. It's louder than movies, louder than television, that sort of thing. But it's not when you get into the K twelve and above. That's when services like Spotify will start turning you down. You'll start getting compressed. Things will yeah. start to go south if you start to mm -hmm. push the level higher than that. So that's yeah. what we're aiming for. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. High, higher levels doesn't mean it gets louder for the listener. <laughs> Always. Exactly. Yeah, it might okay. it starts to sound worse for the listener at that point. Yeah. So let let's um let's make a couple of examples now. I, I we we've both prepared the same multi track uh, mix yes. of of a song. It's got eight, eighteen uh, tracks on it of, of mics and uh, instruments. It was recorded live. Um. So we're going to stream it. You've you've made a mix um, and mm -hmm. uh, sort of produced it at, with with suitable levels, and we, we can maybe watch your level meters while while you play it out. If you share your screen, um, well, I do. I I'd like to show one thing before we do that, which is to show yeah. that calibration process. Okay, yeah. Brilliant. So what does it actually look like? You know, if we're setting levels into streaming software, you know, when you use a tone generator and all that sort of stuff. Because um, I think it speaks to how this is going to work. If that does that make sense to show some of that? Sure. Yeah. At the moment, I, I don't know. Are we, are we in order of what our <laughs> subject? Yeah. I, 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 I otherwise I, I could do it right after you. But no, you you, you go ahead, Ashley. Um, okay. So let me see here. I have to share my screen. So let me uh, do that here. And all right. So here's my. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can see this. Here's my Nuendo screen. And uh, let's see here. Um, I need to get to uh, my test generator. Oop, there we go. Saw it there for a second. Here's my test generator. So I'm gonna send out a tone, a one kilohertz tone at minus 20 dB. Mm. And you'll see it pop up over here. I'm on a K20 meter, just so, so it'll line up right here at zero. Let's take a look right. at that. So that's perfectly at zero. Now, I'm use I use OBS to stream, so yep. um, I'm going to bring over OBS's meter, which is quite good. Here's OBS meter. You can see my my talkback mic is coming through, okay. and uh, what it's hovering around minus eight here. Here's minus twenty. Let's see what happens when I turn this tone generator back on. Just give me one second. Huh? Yeah, and turn it back on. Now, some of you might be saying um, it was a little over. Well, there's it two different indicators. Noise added to it. There's two different indicators going on. Oh. Um, one is the peak. That's what you were seeing fluctuating really fast. Mm -hmm. There's a black hash mark that was sitting right on minus 20, which is the average, oh. the average oh. level of a 1K tone. If you put a peak yeah. meter on 1K tone that reads average, it's that at some point the peak will go above it because it's calculating an average so i mean that's that is the way the obs meter works every meter has their own little 
peculiarities, let's say. So There's you have to learn those. those. Yeah. It's not straight ahead. You need to measure, test, do a mix, try it, see how it sounds, make sure you're not clipping things, you know, that your levels are good. And this is one of the most important things, which is to, to do that before the actual event, you know, test your system, yeah. make sure everything's working the way it should be. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And um, well, I mean, also we've we found when, when we're playing music through Zoom, I think everyone's listening experience could be a little different depending on how much bandwidth they have uh, coming to their device as well. So uh, some people will hear it more clearly if they have uh, be better bandwidth than, mm -hmm. uh, than others, but anyway, let's let's um give them a little example shall we um uh let's playing see the music and watching the levels i'm gonna we can pick it up here at the end of the sax solo and a little break section and hear how it goes into the outro that way you'll see lovely some dynamic change between the sections and see what that looks like yeah um right. and also uh well we'll just look at the, my main meter here real quick and share my screen again Yes, please. And uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Ashley. I'm I'm mixing loud, just so you know. I'm I'm pushing yeah. it probably too much here. You know, uh, I've set this mix up and I'm I keep playing around with it and stuff. On my meter, the max RMS level was my, was uh, uh, 8.9. That's that's uh, up there a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, my peak never went above uh, about a half dB down because that's where I have a brick wall limiter set. So. I'm pushing a little bit. We'll, we'll show examples of when we pull it back a little bit, when we take the gas down and yeah. what that sounds like. And then when you start pushing it more, what that sounds like. So. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. I, I, I've set, set up an, an example here on my TF mixer where I, I have a, a, a DCA level control, which is, is controlling how, well, all of my band is on one, DCA fader. A DCA is a digital control attenuator, so it's just a fader that's adjust, that adjusting the level control of the whole mix. But the whole mix is going to a multiband compressor, uh, which which is act, acting as my sort of soft limiter. So uh, this mixer has multiband compressor that you can insert on a, a aux bus, and you can send all your inputs to the aux bus, and then the aux bus to the stereo master. So the DCA is adjusting all the inputs and they go into that aux bus post fader. So the DCA adjusts the level of them all going to the compressor uh, before the mix goes to the, to the um, live sound. So if I go to my groups here, this is my overall um, DCA here, but I've actually got it on a custom layer. So you can do that on this desk. So on my custom layer, I can see most of my inputs here. I've got my aux here, which if I select, then I can see the multiband compressor on the screen there. And so the DCA will adjust how much um, goes to the compressor. And you might just be able to see how much gain reduction happens when I push the DCA up loud. So uh, let me just play this, uh, play me, pl play you sort of the same clip of music. I'll start off at um, with the DCA at zero. Then I'll, I'll push it up to 10 so it really compresses a lot. And then I'll take it down to minus 10 and we'll, we'll hear it so that there's, there's no compression at all. And then I'll bring it back to zero. Probably everyone hearing through Zoom won't hear so much level change um, as, as I hear myself in, in my earphones, um, hearing the sound that's coming out of the mixer. But uh, it'll give you an idea of what sort of what 
what goes on what happens so here we go a bit more music and i should mute my mic while we're doing that my microphone back on i hope you could all hear that uh clearly enough clearly enough i hope it wasn't distorted you, you, all. you got you have all uh, original sound on right i was realizing i had turned mine on before but i'm just making sure that we all have that turned on with yeah that's with a, that's another another very, good tip, very for, for zoom having original sound on yeah i'm sure we it, do have that on it turns off all that it's from the back of the room yeah yes okay good yeah. <laughs> this is double, i yeah. always have to I, I forget sometimes to turn on original sound in zoom that's one of those key components yeah yeah and and put put uh, the echo cancellation to to minimal uh, as well and mm -hmm. uh, obviously make sure your loudspeakers aren't close to your microphones either <laughs> otherwise you get a lot of echo and possibly feedback so anyway that that gives a kind of example but um um let's briefly mention the problems we had here when when setting up our levels so we're it's going to calibration issue yeah it is a calibration yeah. issue so we're, we're going from dante from our tf1 mixer to um to a di digital vision mixer and it has level meters on a screen which which we realized were were lying to us somehow so um yeah there, there they are now i think you can see them so th this is a a a tricaster mini system you can maybe just make out where those level meters are bouncing on uh, towards the left that they are bouncing around the um, what you can see as the minus 40 position there. But when you look at the levels on my TF mixer, they are bouncing around the minus 20 position here. You know, where we're going from uh, orange to, no, from green to orange. So when I set my oscillator to, to minus 20 here, I was expecting to see minus 20 on, on the TriCaster system, but I was seeing minus 40 on the levels there. Yet, when sending the same Dante stream to another digital audio device, a Yamaha CL mixer, it was showing up at, at minus 20, exactly where you expect. So we were very puzzled about what was going on in TriCaster. So we had to uh, go to manual adjustment settings. Actually, we, we boosted the signal by about 6 dB to get it, to, to get it right, but still the metering is showing us completely the, the wrong scale and it is set to dbfs because there, there are options to set it to something different so um yeah we find a lot of the some of the streaming software it isn't uh, isn't professionally uh set up for level metering so do be aware of that it's a bug <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah it, i mean it's, it's, they might not be the the Audio engineer, my, uh, whoever's working a TriCaster, maybe they don't have somebody who understands the DB full scale system and how it works. Yeah. It I'm seemed sure. to me but... that minus 20 was their zero, was, you know, max. Because if we exceeded mm. minus 20 on your TriCaster meter, it was yeah. clipped, you know, it was all yeah. dust. It was turned turned a little crunchy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we're, we're, we're in touch with their technical support and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll find out what, what's, what's going on. And, uh, it's interesting have, when that happens. We have a solution, uh, for, for us all. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's one, one hurdle. Now I can see we've got like 30 or more than 30 questions here. That's going to be, uh, a, 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 a lot to get through in, in a bit, but, um, um, also we've got a, f a few more bits of content to get through. So, uh, Maybe we've well, spoken enough thing, about level meters for, well, for one now. Thing that but, I, I, but, um, sorry. Yeah, go on, Ashley. <laughs> I never really showed anybody how I'm doing this, right? You were showing your the compressor and limiter, how it was yeah. functioning in TF. And yeah. I, 
I mean, I'm I'm doing a similar thing, basically. And so I would like to show that at least before we move yeah, on. Yeah, I was going to say it's going to answer a lot of these questions. Yeah, we talked okay. talked a lot about level meters, but let, let, let's talk about how to how to to manage the um, the the compression or the dynamics. So you yes. got some good tips for that. Yes. Well, essentially, we have to do some master bus processing, and there are two tools that we can use. One is a compressor, and the other one is a limiter. Uh, the limiter can control that peak output, like a, a brick wall limiter, which is what I'm using in Nuendo at the very end of the, of the mixing chain. And then ahead of that, I'm using a compressor. And uh, basically that allows me to adjust that average level. If I compress the signal more, I'm bringing up the average level of the signal, which can also, which of course will also bring up some of the peaks as well. So it's a two stage system. If you compress the, the mix bus uh, to help bring up that average level and then put a peak uh, brick wall peak limiter after that to control the final peak level so it never exceeds, you know, maybe minus one, minus two dB full scale. That, that's how you control peak to average. Pretty simple. So yeah. I'm going to play a little bit of it and you'll see I'm, I'm, I've been driving the compressor pretty hard. <laughs> but uh, at least you can see what that looks like in the plugins in Nuendo, and then we can, yeah, you know, great. But hey, it, it's pop music. We've come to come to love it with compression, haven't we? So, Every well, people, everybody loves the limiter too. People don't realize yeah. it. The limiter is, is awesome. Let me well, show you. limiter can be very handy. It's awesome. <laughs> All right, so back over here in Nuendo, um, here's my brick wall. I'm using the standard plugins in Cubase, so or Cubase Nuendo, so people, you know, these are not esoteric, crazy plugins or anything. Here's the vintage compressor, and which we control the amount of compression by the driving the input side. The harder we drive the input side, the more compression we will get. And then the brick wall is just going to keep on knocking down the, the peaks no matter what. So here we go. Okay, so I was adjusting the, the input of that compressor to show you how much compression we can get, where it starts to sound really bad there, where I cranked it way up. But that brick wall limiter just kept on knocking down the, the peaks no matter what. That was a lot. To 10 dB of gain reduction on a limiter is a lot. Yeah. Um, but when I backed it down again, it started to sound a lot better. And uh, I'm not compressing a huge amount here. And I really don't have a lot of compressors on individual channels besides the vocals. Um, uh, so it's not like you have to work really hard to get this to work well. You can do a little bit of compression, a little mm. bit of brick wall limiting, and that can do a lot to really bring that dynamic range under control and get your mix sounding good over the live stream. So Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Um, so from now on, we have a choice, a, a kind of little choice of what to do next. I, I was thinking I could play a little pre-recorded uh, teaching session about using the USB connection of this um, and remote controlling the mixer. But then I'm thinking we're going to put that on YouTube on, in in a, in a week or two anyway. So I might leave it because we we've, we've got loads of questions and we got some uh, we got some good topics we can still discuss. So we might just carry on with discussion and avoid uh, playing out that VT thing. Um, but I will just say. The TF mixers have had a version 4.5 update recently, and uh, that includes 
uh, new new abilities with the USB output. So you can use USB output one and two. You can have it to be the stereo master if you want, or you can have it to be the, the matrix output of the mixer. Um, so you can stream then directly from the mixer through USB to your computer and uh, to the outside world. Previously, the channels one and two on USB were, were the direct outputs of inputs one and two, which great for multi-track recording, not so good for live streaming. So now we can choose uh, live to live stream directly from the stereo mix or from a matrix. You can send the stereo mix to a matrix and then on a matrix, you can add uh, some extra EQ or you can add delay. So you can uh, time align it to your video within the mixer rather than having to do it in some other uh, software. So that's a tip. Look out for a video on Yamaha global youtube channel um about about that and i hope you guys don't mind waiting to to see that rather than seeing it now because uh we've got you here for a limited time ashley so um by the way this is trying this to answer webinar, some questions online there real quick the one guy was yeah, asking oh, well, done. That, well done that well done well my monologue <laughs> great well, yeah. yeah, but th th this whole webinar should also be archived on, on YouTube as well in, in a little while. So uh, tell, tell your friends uh, where to find it on the Yamaha Global YouTube channel. But um, actually, if, if I may <laughs> interrupt your, your typing there, um, <laughs> is there some advice we can give about like using high pass and low pass filters? Well, um, I, I, uh, the... The best thing to do with high and low pass filters is a lot of these situations you have to move really fast and um, there can be unknown acoustic variables in the space that you're recording. So mm -hmm. it makes sense to high pass filter vocals to avoid, you know, wind pops and those sorts of things. Maybe even guitar cabinets to a little bit because there's not a huge amount of bottom on guitars. I mean, heavy metal guitars. I know the chug chug sound a lot of people would argue with me on but uh things like that drum overheads just to avoid like if there's rumble in the in the physical space a train goes by the air conditioning has a particular rumble you could filter some of those things out i typically do not use any sort of low pass filtering okay. um unless it's maybe on a bass guitar that's very noisy this you know we got hum or something i, I can because it's bass you know we could we could roll off the top on a bass or something like that um, a lot of times yeah. keyboards, some keyboards can have a huge amount of bottom relative to their musical position in the ensemble and they might not need it. That would be enough, you know, if the keyboard player is playing a lot of bass stuff and interfering with the bass guitar, something like yeah. that. But you wouldn't typically use a HPF or L low, low pass on, on your master output to sort of, I don't know, try, try and compensate for, cause most listeners have tiny little speakers on their, on their Well, the, the only issue it's yes that could be possible if you your monitoring system you can't hear the really really low stuff because then you don't have control over it if you have a good monitoring system and you're in a separate space and you can hear it i, I wouldn't high pass the mix bus if you can't hear it you're in with headphones you don't know what's going on it it's not going to be possible for you to control that then maybe filtering out below 40 maybe 50 mm -hmm. just just to avoid things that you can't have control over that right. might be a reasonable thing to do i try to avoid it if you can but but yeah you know, yeah because yeah, then <laughs> anything over about 40 hertz um starts getting into the frequencies used for for bass guitar fundamental absolutely. notes or, or the, the low notes on the piano yep absolutely so you're really starting to get into musical material when you get about 40 hertz you know, yeah. depends on the slope of the filter too. A more gentle mm -hmm. slope can be, you know, if you're doing something without knowing what's going on, 6 dB per octave, gentle. Um, yeah. Would be where I'd go. And um, you have, I know you have some good advice about using ambient mics, kind of rather than reverb as well when you, when you're mixing a, a live stream in, in, in a good room. Well, I've, I've done a lot of work with Peter Frampton, who's a, you know, famous old guitar player. <laughs> I don't know how yeah. many of the young folks will know him, but uh, he's very famous for live records. And he always instilled in me the concept of feeling like you're there. And the best way to do that is with the live mics, especially if you have an audience, because, 
you 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 hear the participants in the room you can feel like a participant in the room um so now that might require more mix action on your half you know uh if dense sections of music you might need to pull down room mics if it's getting crazy but then at the end when the crowd goes wild you bring up the audience mics and it helps all the listeners feel like they're in the room and if the room has good ambient characteristics there's no better reverb in the world than the room itself that you're in it's cohesive psychoacoustically it matches our visual expectations with what we hear we're very good at at understanding the acoustic environment so room mics are the way to go Especially if you have an audience and you want to catch reactions and, and all that sort of stuff. It's, uh, yeah, if you need, if you got the channels, put some room mics out there or, you know, point them out in the audience and yeah. turn them up. Yeah, I think, I think a key thing is, is to, to match the sound to the, to the picture, isn't it? To ma yeah. make it, make it, make it so the sound is cohesive with, uh, with, with the vision. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Hi hat. Right. On on the right. <laughs> kind of. Although really, when you you know, people always worry about, oh, where do you put the hi hat? Well, if the drummer's normal, right handed, or a, let's say more, most commonly right handed, the hi hat would be over to the right. But on a stage, big wide stage, the drums are in the middle. So yeah. maybe the drums are mono, you know, they don't have to be the width of the stage. That sort of thing. It's interesting. <laughs> indeed yeah yeah Let, let's um let's go through some questions because we have a we have a large number of them yes. here don't we um yes. so thank you everybody for for typing in questions and uh, if we don't have time to answer them all when the webinar's over um in in 10 minutes or so then feel free to stay online or, and um, we might be able to type some answers for you even if we don't answer them them verbally but um um, the, the first question I see here is, what's your approach on vocals that are highly dynamic? Yes, um, and I'm, you I'm... said that was in each scenario. So we, we talked about using a, a compressor and a limiter, but yeah, what if the music has really quiet parts and extreme loud parts? Should we ride the fader a bit in that case? Um, yes, but I put a compressor on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's any form of popular music, if it's not opera, you're used to hearing a compressor on the vocal all the time. So learning how to get that to sound good, that's a key thing. You know, when people, when a pop record, you know, the, the person sings very quiet, that compressor whoosh, massively ramps up their, their, their sound. Um, so don't be afraid of the compressor. Vocals, that's certainly what I do. Like on the mix I was playing mm -hmm. you, the only channels that had individual compressors on them were the vocals. Because yeah. they're incredibly dynamic. And again, we're, we're trying to create the illusion of, uh, of the, the, the dynamics. It's not, it's not real. <laughs> you know? We have to compress yeah. all yeah. of those dynamics into the little window that we have to deliver this material to our listeners. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Compressor. So when, when you're in a quiet listening environment at home, as opposed to being in a noisy uh, live music venue, then uh, those even though you kind of squash the dynamics a bit, they, they, they're they still variable enough for, for you to enjoy it in, in, a, in a quiet listening environment. It's psychoacoustic. When somebody mm. speaks quietly, they sound quiet. Even if their volume is loud, they still yeah. sound quiet. Your your brain is great at, at working with that. I, I, I don't fear right, that. Ashley. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so don't fear the compressor. And... You're not mixing for a PA system, so great large amounts of compression don't don't end up with feedback and stuff like that. Assuming yeah. you're on a distinct system away from the PA mix, you'd have to be careful with that. Um, if you're if you're tweaking a compressor that's also going to a PA system, there could be feedback problems. So that's the yeah. caveat for that. Yeah, great, great. Here's a quick one for you, Ashley. On the subject of dynamic range, between speaking and music, do you gauge your loudness more with the meters or with your ears? Um, your ears are the final arbiter of everything, for sure, without doubt. And what a meter is good for is for correlating. When you know it sounds good, look at the meter. Yeah. Get a mental image of that. So when you when you're working fast, and you don't have time. You're like, uh, 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 well, the meter looks good. Okay, at least we're close. All right, now I listen. You know, it's a combination of the two. The meter is a right. tool for measuring the environment that you're in, but your ears mm. are the final call 
Always. Yeah. Always. So you, if it you sounds good, meters, it is good. <laughs> yeah. You use the meters to confirm what you're hearing. Don't use your ears to confirm what you're seeing on the meters. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Fabulous. Correct. Um, here's an interesting thing, and I, I'm not too sure how to answer this, but do we need to set up a specific EQ while doing a broadcast? That's a, an EQ for the final mix. No. Um, and let me say this, right? Unless your monitoring system is absolutely dialed in, putting some some sort of prefab EQ on there is not a is is not a good idea because you don't know what you what what's going out there. Your ears tell you. Now, that's not to say an EQ on your mix bus isn't appropriate. I do it all the time, but I do it because I want to hear it, not because of some magical. 1 dB boost to 10K shelving and, you know, that's that's poppy poop, you know. Use your ears for that. If you feel like the overall mix is dark and you want to brighten it up, it's very easy to put an EQ on the mix bus and just brighten the whole mix up. It's a lot quicker than going through every channel and trying to turn up the treble on every channel. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. You don't want to get too extreme with it, though. I will say that. If you're doing really extreme moves on an EQ just to get it to sound good, there's probably trouble in the individual channels that you need to address. Right, right. Yeah, and everyone's gonna be listening on different devices with different types of speakers in different rooms with different sound as well. So you, you can't get a, a perfect final mix EQ for, for everybody, can you? So, uh, Right, and um, uh, another thing to do is have a couple set of speakers. I, I, I don't know if you can see my little speakers back here. Yeah. I got a little set of speakers off to the side, it's great. I go from a big Dyn Audios over here to these little NHTs so I can hear the perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Ha ha try and have similar speakers to what, what you imagine people would have at home as well. So mm -hmm. uh, for, for me, just here right, right now on, on my mixer here, I can go from um, queuing or listening to the output of my mixer and I can go to, to queue the, um, the return from my iPad, which is uh, streaming which is picking up the stream of Zoom so I can listen pre-stream and post-stream. And I think that's quite important, isn't it, to have a, yep. a post-stream kind of listen as well. So yes. you, you can experience what the what the uh, viewers are experiencing. Quality control. <laughs> exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another interesting question. And it, it's about um, mixing. Do you mix, should we mix in stereo with pan and so on? Or is it better to mix kind of in mono thinking that a lot of people will, will be listening on a mono device? I think most devices are stereo. I, I really don't think you need to worry about, I mean, mono compatibility. You don't want to have crazy weird face stuff going on. Yeah. You're, you're mixing like a record. It, it's no longer it's 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 live yes it's correlated with a vid, visual image but you're essentially mixing a record so i think stereo is fair game now you maybe with key instruments like the focal instrument like if it's acoustic singer songwriter you might not want to have the uh, guitar on the very left and the vocal on the very right in the worst case scenario where somebody's speakers blown on the left they only hear the lead vocal you might want to mm. keep a cohesive image across but that doesn't mean you can't pan things out and move things around i I definitely mix in yeah. stereo yeah sure but um it, it's always useful to have a a mono button isn't it so uh, on yeah. on on the uh, nuendo on uh, even on the tf mixer there's a mono button in in the q monitor which uh, i think you can assign to a user define key so you can quickly check your mono compatibility for people who, who are listening on mono but yeah even Absolutely. most smartphones seem to have uh, two uh, a pair of speakers in them now, don't they? So iPads, laptops, yes. they all seem to have. Yeah, them. yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's good <laughs> progress. Yeah. Okay, someone's asking about ambient mics, which I think we've already yes. talked about. Um, reference levels, you've already talked about. Oh, someone says thanks for the webinar. Um, our pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Our oh, our pleasure. Um, Live streaming seems to be here for for real. Yeah. And for now we good. we are running out of time, and some of these questions are are, are rather rather long. So I'm not gonna not gonna go to any um, not gonna <laughs> take the time to read any long questions while we're talking live. <laughs> but we'll we'll have a look at them. Um, 
We talked about headroom. There's a question, what's the ideal headroom that we must have in a mix? But I think, like, like you said, it, it, it all depends on the type of uh, content, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, that's why you have those three different K system levels of, of meters with different amounts of headroom. And headroom is the name for that peak to average ratio. Here's your yeah. average. The headroom is the distance above before peak. It's all about peak to average ratio. Yeah, indeed. And um, a related question here, is the peak sound the same as the maximum sound level? Yes, the peak sound, mm. the peak maximum level is the peak. It can't be any louder than that. And so I, I guess the point is, if your peak level is not all the way up to the maximum that the system is capable of, you probably should turn it up a little bit. You know, you, you want to take advantage of the entire dynamic range of the system that you have, whether it's OBS, TriCaster, whatever the system that you're using, you want to make sure you're using all of it. So it's all relative to the peak. The peak is the very top and then where that average falls underneath it. Yeah, yeah. As long as you do allow a nice bit of dynamic range as well and don't just slam everything up to the yeah. <laughs> up to the peak as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that um, the, the 14 dB is sort of your minimum amount of distance. 14 yeah. is good and, and lower is, you know, for more dynamic material. Yeah. Okay, I think one more question, and then we'll then we'll need to need to end. But it's been a, a, a wonderful webinar. Thank you, everyone, for your um, co for your collaboration and cooperation and uh, and questions. We've had over fifty questions. Uh, that's been awesome. That's that's way more than we can cope with in this time. <laughs> we'll have to do a part two webinar so, sometime about this, actually, to fit in all the extra content. But uh, one it's thing a big here. subject. Yeah. When using a limiter, does it introduce any artifacts to the produced sure. sound? Sure, of course. You don't yeah. want you don't want to be compress limiting more than three to five dB. When you start pushing mm. over five dB of of instantaneous limiting, you're starting to sound like distortion. It can get into distortion. So yeah, artifacts for sure. Each limiter has its own characteristics. Some limiters sound better on certain material than others. Yeah, indeed, and. Uh... And you, you all, I was going to say you get what you pay for, but that's not strictly true because uh, some very good limiters come a, a, as part of the package in, in yep. uh, Steinberg's Nuendo and Cubase, don't they? Certainly. But, um, Certainly. Um, you can get some very, yeah, you can get some very expensive limiters, can't, can't you? Uh, Certainly. There's, there's way expensive stuff, and some of those do sound fantastic. But yeah. remember, if it sounds good, it is good. That's the bottom line in any of this stuff. Um, no matter what, nobody cares how much it costs or, or, or what, whatever. If, if it sounds good, it is good. And that's got to trust the old trustees. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a wonderful soundbite to sort of end, end, end the show on today. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> if it sounds good, it, it is good. Um, so just before we leave, well, a huge thank you to you, Ashley, for, for joining us. It's, it's been it's been wonderful to, to chat with you again and, and see you again. It's been a while since I've seen you face to face. Um, so it's, it's great to, to give you a wave over the ether. Yeah, well, we got to get together <laughs> over a curry and a beer here. At, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And one of those ice cream more. towers that we can yeah. find <laughs> in, when we're working in Singapore. <laughs> Durian yeah. ice tower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And th thanks to our technical colleagues. I know you've got some uh, technical help behind the scenes um, on your side so sometimes. And uh, I've got Tim and Mark and Ascot with me here, which has been wonderful. But um, just before we leave, there is some material on the internet that may interest you. So Ashley has helped to write a, a couple of live streaming guides that's on Yamaha's website. Or, or websites because there's different sites for different countries anyway if you type that thing into your browser there yamaha.com slash two slash pro audio that will take you to to the site where you choose your country and then you can find the live streaming guides there also hopefully we can keep in touch on social media we have uh yamaha commercial audio europe uh link no yeah linkedin Facebook page, we have Yamaha Professional Audio, LinkedIn, and we have Instagram, Yamaha Pro Audio Official. Um, and this webinar uh, archive should be appearing on the Yamaha Global YouTube channel sometime soon. 
all our previous webinars are there as well and the video that i was thinking of uh, playing you today about the tf version 4.5 upgrade that will appear on youtube sometime soon as well so you'll be able to catch up with all that data but that's uh that's it from us um we shall leave you all to to uh make waves in a few minutes but um <laughs> thank you for joining us and yeah, like i said if you have a question that's not answered yet then stay online and, and, I'll, and I'll i'll try and try, try and get through them and type some answers for you um otherwise maybe we'll see you in the next webinar which uh which yeah we're we'll get planning straight away okay <laughs> thank you for joining us everyone thank you ashley and uh my pleasure take care yeah take care and see you again soon